So hey everybody, um, I'm Mark Wethington, director here at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. And um, this is perhaps my favorite time of year in the garden, uh, just because uh, my favorite plant in the world is flowering right now. Um, you can probably see it behind me. Uh, Osmanthus, uh, Osmanthus fragrance is in full flower right now. And it is just the most fragrant, fragrant plant. Um, you know, if you live where it's cold, then you shouldn't because you can't grow Osmanthus. Uh, zone seven is about as cold as you can do Osmanthus fragrance. We'll talk about some other ones that will tolerate a little bit more cold. Um, but Osmanthus is in a kind of an odd family. So I want to talk about that whole family as well and some of the relatives of Osmanthus. So Osmanthus is in the Oleaceae family. Olea is the genus for olives. So, you know, your olive oil, your, your green olives, your, your black olives, these are all in the same family as Osmanthus. Every, all these are in the olive family. And it's an odd family because it grows everywhere. North, we have native ones in North America. We have native genera, in, they're native genera in South America, in Africa, in Europe and Asia and like the um, uh, like Sarawak and Indonesia and places like that. Um, I don't know if there are any down in, in um, uh, Australia, New Zealand, any native uh, ones, but it wouldn't surprise me if there were. And there are some plants that it's easy to tell what family they're in. If you show me a dogwood, um, I can tell you it's a dogwood, even when it's not in flower. I may have to do a little messing around with it. It may take me a few minutes to get there, but I can tell you what it is. Uh, Osmanthus, or, um, excuse me, Oleaceae, the olive family, not so much. Um, they can be trees or shrubs or woody vines. Um, they, you know, when you look them up, it'll say, you know, mostly such and such, and then something, mostly whatever. So a couple of mostly hard and true things, not completely, is uh, the leaves are opposite. So um, I'll show you that on uh, these, these leaves as we go through, but there are some of the African ones are can be alternate, not just opposite, but most are opposite. And usually the flowers have four petals or sometimes multiples of four. There are exceptions to that. And mostly they have separate male and female plants. Uh, they're dioecious. But again, that's not hard and fast either. But when they are male, they usually have two stamens in there. Um, which is kind of unusual. You'd think a four petaled flower would have four stamens. It's usually how a lot of plants are. So it is a big family. I don't have, there's about, well, I shouldn't say it's a big family. There are about 29 genera in um, the olive family. Some of the main ones are uh, olives, of course, osmanthus, jasmine, ligustrum, uh, fraxinus, the, the ashes, and privet and lilacs. So we're going to look at, at some of those. Um, so start with my favorite because it's in flower and it smells so good. This is Osmanthus fragrance. And this is the typical form. It's got white flowers, really nice uh, white flowers. Um, the foliage on Osmanthus, like on all of these, is opposite. Um, you can see the branching is opposite. Uh, on there, and the flowers are mostly coming from the leaf axils, they're axillary. Some plants have axillary flowers, some have terminal flowers, and you can have either or or both in the olive family. Now, these make incredible evergreen shrubs. They'll get big over time. They can be limbed up. Uh, there are some beautiful, you know, 20 foot tall specimens around Raleigh and throughout the South where they've been limbed up and you can see this beautiful gray bark. I have seen them as large as about 35 feet tall in, um, in Asia with trunks that I could barely put my arms around. Uh, 
really in, in just amazing plants. Mostly flower at this time of year, but often you'll get flowers in the spring as well. So there are three main forms of osmanthus fragrance. There's what we just saw, osmanthus fragrance. There's osmanthus fragrance variety orantiacus. And orantiacus, or, that means orange. So these are orange flowered, um, an orange flower type. Uh, and again, they just get loaded with flowers. Now, unfortunately, uh, the orantiacus types tend to flower for a shorter period. So they don't last as long on the plant as the, the typical white flowered one. But the plants are often neater. They tend to be tighter and more upright, which uh, I think is really nice. They fit into the garden better. Um, there is one that a lot of people are enjoying right now. It's called Apricot Echo. And it just keeps flowering a little bit all throughout the season, uh, but never gets just absolutely loaded with flowers. Um, it is, Apricot Echo is a crazy fast growing plant. Um, and that's because it doesn't want to shut down when it's cold. It'll keep growing uh, every time it warms up in the winter. And so you'll often get the tips die back, which is good for me because in my garden, it kind of keeps it contained. Um, the other nice thing about Apricot Echo is that new growth on there is uh, really dark, dark uh, purple black before becoming um, this typical green. Now you can see those white ones and the orange ones pretty often, but there is another um, variety that's uh, variety Thumbergii. Um, Thumberg does not mean yellow. Uh, Thumberg was an explorer in Japan and one of the earliest explorers in Japan. And when I say explorer, what I mean is he was on a boat in a harbor and they wouldn't let people off for the most part, but they brought feed for the animals that were on board. And so these compressed masses of, of uh, uh, plant material, they would go through, the botanists would go through and, and find all these plants in there. So Thumbergii is one with yellow flowers, and there are several out there, but you really have to go to a specialist nursery usually to get them. Uh, this is one called Butter Yellow. We've got Conger Yellow. We've got just straight variety Thumbergii. This, um, to me, has a, there's a little undertone to that fragrance that's not quite as appealing as the others. Um, it gets described in different ways, but my daughter, when she was very young, described the smell of osmanthus uh, fragrance as like peach soda. I don't know where she had ever had peach soda, but I, I kind of get where she's coming from with it. Now, that's the one that is most often grown in the South. As you go a little farther, uh, uh, north especially, up into warmer zone six, you get um, Osmanthus heterophilus. Heterophilus, hetera, different, phyllus leaf. So and it's, you get that name, that different leaf, um, because as a young plant, you'll have very much this holly-like leaf. Not sure, can you get that? That little holly, you know, spiny holly leaf. Now, you know it's not a holly because holly's leaves are alternate, whereas osmanthus leaves are opposite. And luckily for students in plant ID, osmanthus and opposite start with O so you can remember. I won't say that if you're 50 years old and have been doing this professionally for 30 years that you still need to use that in your head sometimes, um, but you know, hey. So, there are a lot of different forms of heterophilus. This is the more popular one in terms of diversity because it's, it's over a wider range. Um, but you can see how this is another one. You can see this is more the adult type foliage where it is um, just a, a, it doesn't have the spines around the leaf like these do. Um, so the typical form will grow as a young plant, have these holly leaves. As it gets older, they become entire. Uh, some of the selections out there, this is one that we really like that we're promoting through uh, with our choice plant program from Japan called Kaori Himi, which translates to 
fragrant princess. Hime means princess and is often designated on plants that don't get as big as others. So some Japanese maples have hime in the name, H-I-M-E, and that means they're smaller. Uh, this one uh, is a, a dense growing type plant. I won't say it's small. Uh, it'll get pretty big. In 10 years, it can get six or eight feet tall, um, but it is uh, slower growing than other uh, of the holly leaf tea olives, uh, Osmanthus heterophilus. Um, this is another compact one. This one actually uh, comes out with in the spring with uh, kind of comes out burgundy, goes pink, becomes white, and then green. You can see it retains a little bit of that white around the edges on it. Um, and this is one that's called Xien is the ja is the the Japanese name, and it's sold as party lights. I think that's that's the name that they give it. Several variegated ones. One of the most popular of all the Osmanthus, most widely sold, is this one called Goshiki. Goshiki uh, means kind of um, five color uh, is is kind of where it translates to. Um, and right now you're just seeing kind of green and creamy white, but in the spring with new growth, you get pinks and yellowish colors and creams and greens and whites all through there. Uh, so you do get those multiple colors. This is one plant that I have seen fruit on more often uh, than others. Most of what we grow in, in the US, especially Osmanthus fragrance, are all male plants. They don't uh, produce fruit. Um, but there are some breeding lines in China, especially in Japan, that do fruit that they use for um, production and breeding purposes. So we've been getting in some of those uh, in order to grow out seed of them and because and, um, I think there is breeding potential. So a really nice variegated one there. Another variegated one, um, and there are two that are similar to this, of the holly tea olive is uh, this is one called Kembu, which means sword dance. And if you kind of look at it, all the leaves are kind of uh, almost sickle shaped, or most of them are, and outlined with white. Really strong grower, really nice plant. There's also one that doesn't have this distortion on the leaf and is much of uh, more of a white uh, margin that's called just uh, variegatus. So, oh, and there are, if, if the young foliage of some isn't spiny enough, uh, there are some uh, with these incredibly kind of congested, very, very tough spiny um, leaves on there uh, of the same um, species. And uh, there are different ones that are a little hard to tell apart. This is Hariyama. More commonly, you'd see um, uh, it just flew out of my head. Uh, Yatsu, not Yatsubusa, Sasaba, Whoop. pulled it out. Um, Sasaba more commonly, but looks very similar to this with that long, ow, see if I can pull off a leaf, um, almost maple she shaped uh, leaf on it. But with a long central spine. So at some point, uh, and according to literature I can find, only one time um, that it's been recorded, uh, Osmanthus fragrance was crossed with Osmanthus uh, uh, heterophyllum to create this hybrid called Osmanthus fortunii. Um, Osmanthus fortunii tends to have just the purest white flowers of any of the Osmanthus. Um, really, really nice, a little bit larger a lot of times than the other ones. Now, it usually, it's hard to see on this one, this one's a little bit older, but it'll have some of those kind of holly-like serrations on there. Um, but sometimes you can get it with pretty much entire leaves like Osmanthus fragrance. But the leaves are a little stiffer, which they get from Heterophilus, and a little glossier, which they get from Heterophilus, but larger, uh, like they get from fragrance. And it has a really, uh, this and Heterophilus, Instead of that fruity kind of smell, it's much of a much of a sweeter smell that I like, but not nearly as much. 
So while the cross has only been made one time that I know of, it has uh, it does produce seeds sometimes, and seedlings have been grown and distributed. Um, here's kind of a, a more typical uh, younger leaf for Osmanthus fragrance with more of that holly kind of uh, edge to it. Um, but there's also some, like this one that uh, you can find in the trade often called Jim Porter. Jim Porter was a great gardener and, and his Osmanthus uh, would seed around in the garden. Now this is often put as Osmanthus uh, uh, Fortunii, the hybrid between the two, but most likely it's a hybrid with Osmanthus armatus, which has kind of this elongated, very deeply serrated leaf but it stays tight, grows upright. Um, all of these tolerate shearing and cutting, so um, they're used quite often that way. There's a total of 29 species of Osmanthus currently, um, and very few of them are, are actually grown except for these three. So lots of room for them to, to grow, for us to grow more. Now, there used to be a North American native Osmanthus. It no longer exists, not because it went extinct, but because the botanist decided that it was not an Osmanthus. So now they call it Cartrema. So this used to be Osmanthus Americanus. Now it is Cartrema Americana. Um, and this grows throughout the Southeast. And you can see these are the flower buds on there. So it does flower differently than typical osmanthus in that it flowers on these little spikes. These will open up to white flowers. Typically grows as a shrub, although I was stumped by this plant when I was visiting uh, an Arboretum supporter. I was at her garden and it was out by a pool, limbed up into a multi-trunk tree in full flower. And I looked at it and she said, what is it? And I said, I should know what this is. I should know, it looks like something I know. And it wasn't until I, I got back to the Arboretum and it kind of going through my head, I was like, I know what it is. And at that time I still called it Osmanthus Americanus, but Cartrema. Now Cartrema is weird because there is the Southeastern species uh, and it grows that Southeastern US down into Florida. Um, and, I mean, into Mexico and some of the islands. Uh, and there's another Mexican species with a smaller range. Um, excuse me, a Florida species that just has a very restricted range. And then the other two species of the four um, are from Thailand and, and uh, down in the, the Indonesian islands. So it's a weird disjunct between our Cartrema and the other, but it's not as nice a plant as the, the Asian Osmanthus. It's kind of open and rangy, it's, it's nice sometimes called devil wood, you may know it as that, but it's it's not a great garden plant. It's a great garden, a great plant for the woodland where you kind of put it to the side. Unless you grow it into a beautiful big multi-trunk tree and have it over your pool in full flower, that was pretty. There is a variegated form that's not very stable called um, Woodlander's Amanda, came from Woodlander's Nursery in Aiken, South Carolina, which is closing in the next pretty short amount of time. So if you have been thinking about getting plants through mail order from Woodlander's Nursery, do it now because it's gonna be closing down. It's one of the nurseries that introduced a tremendous number of plants um, into horticulture. But uh, Wood, Woodlander's uh, Amanda is, is what that plant is. All right, we're gonna move out of the Osmanthus uh, and Cartrema realm into some of the other ones, but we'll start with a really common plant. Now this is one that probably many of you grow, have grown, grew up in a house that had, had neighbors who had it. Um, the leaves can be different on there, but this is Forsythia. So we all know Forsythia, right? Flowers in the spring, beautiful plant in spring. Um, Eh, doesn't do a whole lot after spring, but it's it's a gorgeous plant when it does flower. And I gotta admit, for a while in my life, I was a real plant snob and I was like, oh, Forsythia is such a common plant. But you know, 
it doesn't die. It's easy to grow as long as it's getting enough sun. Actually, it'll grow in not a whole lot of sun, just doesn't look very good. Um, but it just performs and performs and performs. And you can cut it to the ground if it gets too big. You can do like my father-in-law and prune it into a hedge um, so that you have this kind of gold hedge uh, when it flowers. And then it becomes green and then it's just twiggy over the winter. But if you do that, it's dense enough twiggy that you can't see through it. So it does the work of an evergreen hedge. Now, it, it, we know it flowers in the spring. Um, this is a one that got a little bit confused, but you can see it's got flowers on there. Um, those gold four petal flowers. Uh, most that we see in the trade are um, either male or female. Um, this is a female one. But because usually people are growing all the same ones, you don't usually get a whole lot of fruit on your uh, forsythia. Um, they, they're all from Asia. They're into, into Europe a little bit, but super easy plants. And what they're good for is I've always, I'm not a lawn person, but I've always been told you put down your, your weed and feed uh, for your lawns when the forsythia are blooming. That's how you know. So even if the climate changes or the weather for the year changes and we have a really long cold winter and, and spring and the forsythia aren't flowering, you wait until they do flower and that's when you put it down and that's when you'll be most effective. There are some funky things. There are some gold leafed ones and this old one, which kind of came and went and people forget about it, but I still think it's a cool plant, um, is one called Cumson. Uh, that, uh, that just has these these uh, gold veins all through the leaf. And I just think it's just a cool, cool uh, foliage plant. I don't care about the gold flowers in the spring. They're nice, but I actually, um, when I've grown this personally, not growing it right now, but when I've grown it personally, um, I will cut it back either over the winter if I get tired of it, or I'll cut it back right after it flowers and let it reflush for me so I get lots more of this um, really uh, kind of vigorous, lush growth with, with those gold veins. Okay. So, next one are ashes. So. Yeah, I mentioned that these olive families members can have all kinds of different, nothing's kind of the same about them. Uh, so there's a lot of them that have fruit that are like olives. They're what you call a droop, a fleshy fruit with one big seed in it, sometimes two seeds. Ashes, if you grew up anywhere north or pay attention to, to ashes, they have what they call paddles, which are, if you know the whirligigs from uh, uh, maple samaras, those uh, maple keys or samaras, the little gig ones, these are just straight instead of curved like that. So a fat end with the seed and then a, a, a straight, one single straight wing. And that's for the same reason, they kind of flutter in the breeze. So ashes, unlike the other ones we've talked about, have pinnate leaves. So this is one leaf uh, with leaflets on there. Um, they can have a different number of leaflets uh, in different size, depending on the type. This is, uh, this is one that, that Tim Alderton, our horticulturist, got for me. I'm not sure right off the bat which one it is. I think it might be um, uh, Fraxinus uh, insularis, which is one of the Asian flowering uh, ashes, which the flowering ones have big showy uh, flowers on their clusters of flowers, um, as opposed to our native ones. Now, this is an ash as well. This is a southwestern uh, U.S. native called uh, Fraxinus gregii. Um, and you can see it's still got that pinnate leaf, but much smaller, grows more as a shrub, you see it's got a little bit of that silvery gray that you often see on uh, kind of dryland plants. We grow this uh, in, in the dry areas like our, our scree garden and our xeric garden, um, but it's, I think it's a beautiful shrub. I never really pay attention to it in flower. Uh, I don't think it's very showy, but it's, it's a beautiful little shrub. Uh, let's see, that's same, that's 
same thing. Now, some of the large uh, fraxinus, like our native uh, uh, white and green ashes, uh, you know, when you look at them, you have stems like this in the winter, really stout, stout stems. And the buds are always really um, apparent. You get this kind of horseshoe shaped leaf scar and then the, the bud on top. And that's often how they're identified is by those leaf scars and, and buds on there. Uh, this is not one of our native ones. This is uh, the um, English ash, uh, it's often called. Um, Fraxinus excelsior, uh, and there are a lot of selections of this because it's widely grown in England. Uh, this is actually, it doesn't look like it now, but with the, the new growth in the spring, this is a gold uh, uh, stemmed one. Uh, that's an, a real old one that's, that's very nice. Um, ashes are kind of going out of fashion um, because emerald ash borer is killing them out over large areas of the country. Um, especially up farther north where they're widely planted. They're not so widely planted here. They're not so widespread in our woods with native ones, although we have them. So it's a little bit harder for the, the emerald ash borers to move around, but there are some reports of ash, emerald ash borers attacking some of these other plants in the family. I'll finish up with one ash that is uh, an Asian one, um, a Fraxinus seboldii. Uh, this one's called um, Rising Sun, and it's got kind of splashed irregular variegation on it. So, you know, we like the funky things uh, out here, but not really showy as a garden plant, um, but funky anyway. Okay, now I'm gonna move into one that people may boo and hiss about, privet. Privet, uh, one of the terrible, terrible weeds we have uh, in, the, in the Southeast. Um, there are several broadleaf, um, you know, kind of the, fall in the uh, glossy leaf uh, uh, ligustrums, widely used as hedges. Why? Because they're tough as nails. Um, some are evergreen, some are not. They're actually pretty when they flower. I think they smell terrible. They're pretty when they fruit, and the birds absolutely love the fruit and will spread it around. I am not telling you to plant um, wax leaf privet or the, the small leaf Chinese privets. Uh, this is a gold leaf one that was introduced, not from us, but here in North Carolina called Sunshine. Uh, Sunshine is right now one of the most widely sold shrubs in the Southeast. It is seedless as long as it doesn't revert. It will never, um, and we've been growing it for t almost 20 years now, has never flowered or fruited for us, but I have seen reports where a, a branch will revert to green and if that grows out, it, will, uh, it can flower and fruit. So be careful of that. Also, if you plant this, you can, you can shear it into some, any size you want, but don't pay attention to what's on the tag because this will become a huge monster, um, you know, 18 feet by 18 feet uh, wide if you don't do any pruning on it. Fair warning. There are some other um, privets that aren't as widely grown that are kind of neat. This is Ligustrum uh, Chihu, I think is how it would be pronounced in Chinese. Uh, it starts with a Q, Quijou if, if you're more American. And you can see this is what um, a lot of ligustrums will look like when they flower. Most ligustrums are terminal flowering plants. They'll, they'll flower just on the ends and not down in all these leaf axles. Um, yeah, this smells like privet. Uh, it is one of those smells of my, um, my childhood spring. Um, you know, I didn't know it was privet at the time, but I can always, always smen, uh, smell it. Eh, you know, this is kind of a funky one. Never seen it seed around, but also never really much seen it for sale. So. And there are better plants out there. Don't plant privet. You don't need to do that. Okay. Another one that's in fruit for us. This is jasmine, jasminum. 
uh, the true jasmine, not to be confused with all the things that we call jasmine, uh, star jasmine, confederate jasmine, everything like that. Um, this is the true uh, jasmine. Um, and there are a few different types. Let's see. Now, these are two different ones. So this is one um, we collected in China a few years back. It has nice yellow flowers, and then they give rise to these small um, fruits that'll turn uh, glossy black, uh, really pretty. It's one of those plants that can't decide if it wants to be a shrub or a vine. So you can kind of have it a cascading mound, or you could try and train it to grow up something or hang it over a wall. Um, haven't seen any signs of it of it being weedy or seeding around, so I think we're in good shape there. But it's a it's a neat little plant. We don't know the species on this one quite yet, although we think we're narrowing it down. This is another one very similar that we grow, and you can see most, not all, um, most of at least the shrubbier, not so vining ones ha are pinnate but trifoliate with three leaflets on there. Some of the real vining ones are more pinnate. Um, but this is very similar to the other but with smaller fruit. This is another one with even smaller leaves, um, smaller flower buds. There's a real small one that makes a little nice kind of spreading almost ground cover called Jasminum parkeri, which somebody has told me was one of the first plants J.C. Ralston ever bought with his own money or so, as a child. I'm not sure about that, but I really, I really like those little ones. Moving on, uh, kind of a, a odd plant. This is a Southeastern native privet relative, um, sometimes called swamp privet or, or something like that. There are a few of these really oddball ones. This is Forestera. Um, Forestera angustifolia. Angustifolia means narrow leaf, and you can see the narrow leaf. And this is a weeping form of it that was found by woodlanders, I believe. Um, it, it grows almost in this kind of, the branches and almost kind of fishbone pattern, and it makes a big wide spreading plant. You might be able to see that it's got some fruit on there, uh, some little black fruits. It's, it's a native plant though. Um, some other kind of uh, what we call bios plants, uh, kind of like this, Fontanesia and some other ones. Bios, that means botanical interest only, meaning it's a, not a good garden plant. Now this weeping form is a good garden plant. It can get big, but you prune it and it makes these this really architectural arching form. Um, and it drops its leaves in the winter. And in the winter, it's just this kind of silvery, a uh, really rigid but graceful silhouette. Um, it's a beautiful thing. And actually, you know, Blake, who is, I'm putting through the ringer by making him try to film me as I move things around and try and show little tiny things. Uh, Blake does um, bonsai. And this actually may be a really interesting bonsai subject just because of how it weeps and cascades and can kind of look old um, before it's time. All right, getting back to things that people actually often plant is a uh, fringe tree, our native fringe tree. Uh, this is a really um, large leaf, vigorous, beautiful form of our native fringe tree, Cyanthus retusus, excuse me, Cyanthus virginicus. Um, and if you want to know how to identify it, I learned it by getting it wrong on my plant ID exam back, one of, one of my uh, plant ID quizzes back in the day in college, and I've never forgot, you look for the scaled, the keeled uh, bud scales. That's how you can tell. They've got, they're like the keel of a boat. And I'm not gonna try and make uh, uh, Blake get in there close enough to do that, because I can barely see it from this close. Um, that goes with that. So this is our native. This is a really nice dark green, um, thick leafed form. Typically they're a little thinner, a little bit um, a paler green. Uh, this is Emerald Knight, which is a really nice one. Uh, the Chinese fringe tree, I have given talks on uh, great small flowering trees and I've, I've asked, you know, send uh, emails out to uh, my colleagues 
and ask them, you know, give me your top three small flowering trees. And probably 85%, every time I've done that, come back with Chinese fringe tree as one of those trees. They are tough. They've got this thick, glossy uh, leaf. Uh, they will um, uh, uh, tolerate really tough conditions, urban conditions. They can get really nice gold fall color. They don't always. Um, and they're separate male and female plants. So you can get male or you can get female. If you get female and they hybridize, they cross with a male, you'll get fruit like this. Um, the males tend to be showier in flower, but both are very showy um, when they're flowering. Uh, interestingly, this tree at the Arboretum was male, had always been male until 2007 when we had the 100 year drought. The following year, it was female. Go figure. Um, and really, I've gone up and looked at it, and I should say it is, uh, it is now gynomonitious. So that means it is, has both male and female flowers um, on it, but predominantly female flowers. And, and plants can do that. There are some plants that regularly shift between male and female flowers. Um, the cobra lilies, erysemas, do that. Uh, they'll be male, 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 and then they'll get kind of big enough and old enough and they'll turn to female or have both and go back and forth. Um, and often, while hollies are always held up as the, the plant that is dioecious, meaning separate male and female plants, the truth is, if you go into a big wild population and look at them in flower, if you are really bored and have a lot of time, um, you'll find plants that are all female and all male, that's typical, but you'll also find some that'll have both male and female flowers on the same plant, just not as many. So um, last, but certainly not least, especially for the people who move here from up north and come here and say, I can't grow lilacs, I can't grow lilacs. Lilacs, syringa is in the, the same family. So the common lilac with the big heart-shaped leaves um, that are always opposite um, leafed, you know, this is in the same family as osmanthus. You know, they both smell really good. Um, probably not so close that we could cross them. I wonder what would happen if you cross, you know, purple and orange, what, what you would get. Um, but, you know, these are great shrubs and there's a lot of different species of them and different types. Some do grow better for us than others uh, here in the South. The, the common lilac that everybody loves up North is not a great plant for us. It gets powdery mildew, has a lot of problems, but there's been more and more hybrids that have done um, better and better. If you can find them and you want this, this, you know, you moved here from up north and you really, really, really want the, the, the old style um, lilac that'll do well for you here. They're hard to find, but if you can find the ones that sound like they came from the U.S. National Arboretum, which they did. So Betsy Ross, Constitution, Declaration, those have proven to be really good Southern lilacs. And there are other ones that aren't quite what you're wanting if you want that old Southern one, uh, old uh, common lilac, but there are some good ones. There's also lilacs that grow into trees, the tree lilacs, which don't have those lavender purple flowers. They have creamy white flowers, really very much like a privet, um, but they don't seed around all over the place. But they'll grow up into trees, often have really nice bark, usually have smaller leaves. This is a really small leafed uh, species that we collected in, um, in China several years ago. Still hasn't flowered for us, so we haven't keyed it out. Um, but it's, it's probably, uh, it's not Syringa reticulata because the leaves are not reticulate um, terribly, but it could be uh, Syringa pectinensis or something like that. Most of these tree lilacs are very tolerant of heat, but also very, very cold tolerant. So, 
those are some of the main um, genera in the Oleaceae. Uh, when you get past that, you start to get into more and more tropical, subtropical ones that um, you, I did, I, we don't grow that, so I couldn't uh, get you uh, uh, samples of them to cut, but love to answer questions you might have. Okay, somebody asked, uh, what is Jim Porter a cross of, Fragrans and what? It is most likely Fragrans and Osmanthus armatus, A-R-M-A-T-U-S. Alrighty, and somebody asked, are you saying Woodlanders is closing for good or just closing for the season? Um, I understand that they're closing for good. I don't, I'm giving that to you secondhand, but it came from a pretty reliable source. Okay. Somebody says, I want to replace an Arborvitae next to the garage with a Party Lights Osmanthus. The Arborvitae roots invaded the underground downspout piping. Will this happen with an Osmanthus as well? So if your underground uh, downspout piping has any holes in it where water can seep out, plants, roots will grow into it, period. That's, they will not, if you have a solid pipe and it does not leak, I don't care if it's, if it's copper, well, copper, that'll keep it out in different ways, but no matter what it is, metal, PVC, plastic, if there are no leaks, that is just like a rock to a, a root. It can't get in there because there are no holes to get in there. But if at any of the joints there's a, a hole or if you've, been digging around it and you've nicked it, water will seep out of there and water will sit in the bottom of that, that pipe, you know, a little bit. And roots will, uh, they, they won't go find water. They're not intelligent. But what they do as they spread their roots out, if they find a place with, with moisture, they will proliferate there and will clog up a pipe um, because that's where water is and they want water uh, as part of what they need. So. Yes, uh, if you have a typical, you know, black corrugated uh, uh, downspout pipe buried under there, there's a good chance that it is not um, where it's connected to another one. It is not sealed, uh, watertight, and yes, the roots will grow in there. Okay. Somebody's asking, is Osmanthus Americana deer resistant like the other tea olives? We've got a flyover going on, so I, I, I didn't hear the question. Okay. Is Osmanthus Americana deer resistant like the other tea olives? Um, okay, yeah. Uh, well, it's Cartrema Americana yes. now, but yes. <laughs> Osmanthus Americana. Uh, Americana. My guess is, yes, it's pretty um, deer resistant, deer tolerant. Um, I haven't grown it enough, but I don't see it nibbled on out in the woods much, so where it's growing wild. So I would think so. Okay. Uh, somebody's asking, my Osmanthus apricot ep echo is in the shade of the deck and does not bloom. It is two years old. Does it need more sun? It'll definitely flower better in more sun. Mm. Um, but, you know, Osmanthus will typically flower in mm, relatively shady spots, but yeah, they do like sun, but two years old, it might still need another couple of years. Okay. And uh, what are the general growing conditions for Osmanthus? Uh, moist, well-drained, acidic soil in sun to part shade. But you know. once, once <laughs> established, they're pretty tolerant. Um, there really are huge old ones around um, Raleigh and all through the South that have been there for ages and ages and ages that have been trampled on and, you know, whatever. It's, it's, so they really will um, last. Okay. What is the best way to prune the orange blooming variety to keep the height below 15 feet? Um, prune it uh, after it flowers. Okay. Yeah, I, I would prune it uh, once it goes dormant going into fall uh, through, or, you know, midwinter. Hmm. Uh, it can, especially Apricot Echo, but all of them can, if it warms up, they will tend to flush some growth out. And if it gets cold again, it'll kill that. Um, so you get these little burnt tips on it, but generally that doesn't hurt it. Now, if we get a, 
you know, a, an exceptionally cold winter, it can do some, some real damage to Osmanthus. It's been 15, 20 years since we've really had uh, an Osmanthus kind of damaging winter here. So, and we may never again, I guess, but you know, it could happen, especially with young ones. Sure. Will the American fringe tree hybridize with the Asian? It's a good question. Um, I don't know if it will. Uh, I know that uh, a plant breeder here at NC State, Tom Ranney, was tr doing some hybridization work with, uh, or at least trying to, with um, uh, fringe tree, Cayenanthus. Uh, one of the ones that, one of the things that he really wanted to do, there's a South American uh, Cayenanthus, Cayenanthus peruviana, that has pink flowers. Uh, it is not hardy here um, at all. And he was trying to get a hardy pink flowering um, uh, fringe tree. And I don't think he ever got, um, got hybrids going. I think it didn't cross. I would guess that he had looked at the, the compatibility of uh, the, the native and the, the Chinese, and it doesn't work. Um, just different uh, um, ploidy levels. Um, uh, so uh, it would, that would be my guess, because I would think we would have seen it by now if you could do it. Um, so, yeah. Okay. And it looks like everything else in the comments is just comments about beautiful osmanthuses that they've seen, which, you know, we'll take it, definitely. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today for this wonderful talk about the tea olive family. I know I learned a lot. I hope you all learned a lot as well. And I'd like to remind you to come back and join us next week for our midweek program where we're going to be doing Deeper in the Garden, Amazing Aspidistra with Tim Alderton. So Tim's going to tell us all about Aspidistra, which should be glorious. So thanks and again. Deer proof. And deer-proof. Always question. Deer-proof. All right. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We'll see you next time.